came to Grace Wave as a result of my wife hearing a message that touched her heart, that Truman Dollar was preaching at the time, and he was talking about uh, ministering to some African-American children that they were busing to the church. And she was very impressed with that. Well, my first inclination was not to come to the Baptist Temple, but to go to another church. But I decided that since my wife wanted to do this, I wanted to come with her. So we wanted to be together as a family and not split up. So we came to the Kansas City Baptist Temple as a result of that. And we later found out that this is where God really wanted us. I had a friend who was working with me who told me that uh, after 1964, they had signed the Civil Rights Act in uh, Washington, D.C. Our government had, had made it possible for me as an African-American to find gainful employment for what I was qualified to do. And so I reapplied at TWA and I was hired in uh, February of 1966 as a mechanic. I met one of my fellow employees and uh, one day he came to me to speak with me about my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, which I did not have at the time. I didn't really want to be bothered uh, with that kind of talk. He kept loving me as a friend and he didn't badger me. And I watched his life, I observed him, and he was very loving. And he was a Caucasian. And in those days, we didn't have, I didn't have that great a relationship with, with, with white people. But he was so loving and as a friend, and God brought me under conviction through his life and his testimony. And so as a result of my relationship with him, I, I came to faith in Jesus Christ. There was so much uh, turmoil between the races in the 60s. And this is the very time that God sent a white man to me to give me the gospel and to love on me as a brother. And uh, I believe in that way, once I got saved, he began to take me into his environment and the environment of which I wasn't used to being in because he would ask me to, to go with him to certain churches to give my testimony, which were all white churches. And I had to go into that environment for something I really wasn't used to doing. And in that way, God prepared me, began to prepare me for the, the, uh, the uh, uh, cross-cultural ministry at the Baptist Temple. And so as things progressed through the years, as to where they are now, because our church is so so culturally diverse, uh, I've, we fit in uh, quite well with that because we have been prepared for that. And so uh, when I when the class that I was asked to teach was a class of senior adults, which I believe God had also prepared me for because I had been raised basically by my grandmother, and I had had a lot of associations with with uh, senior adults. And uh, so he gave me them to nurture uh, uh, as, a, as their uh, Sunday school teacher and pastor. And it was a perfect fit. Having been at Graceway for almost 40 years and through all of the things that we have learned from the time we came up until this time, we are grateful to God for all that he has taught us. Uh, we are grateful to God that we have seen people come and we have seen people go for any number of reasons, but we believe that he has planted us here to be a blessing and to bring glory to him. And uh, we, are, we are glad to have been a part of, and to be a part of what God is doing here at Graceway. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Jeff Adams. I'm glad you're here this morning, and our thanks to Pastor Sam for sharing his I Am Graceway story. Uh, every one of you has a story, and together, uh, that story is the story of Graceway. Last week, you got to hear a little bit of my story. And uh, by the way, before I go any further, uh, I, I just want to express my thanks to you uh, for enduring with me last week and for the many expressions of love and support uh, that I have received from you since that time. It's been uh, pretty interesting to see the reaction to that 
And uh, especially some of you who are PTSD sufferers yourself, you've been very encouraging and said, yeah, people who have never been through PTSD don't understand what a big deal it is uh, to tell your story. And we know how hard that was. And uh, after more than 30 years uh, for Cheryl and I to be able to say, well, we think it's about time to tell our story. And uh, wow, uh, you were just so loving and supportive. And I really thank you for that. It's been pretty interesting. We have uh, received contact from Salvadorans all over the planet, literally, uh, this last week, who in one way or another have come across the story and uh, have been saying, yeah, that's you're right, that's not just your story, that's our story, the story that we live together. And of course, we've got a lot of Salvadorans right here in our own church who went through these times with us and uh, other people. In fact, I, got, I even had a couple of people from high school contact me that I haven't seen since high school. How they got a hold of the story, I have absolutely no idea. It's just funny the way that social media and, and all of that works. And so again, my, my heartfelt thanks to you. And by the way, if you were not here last week and, and haven't heard my story. Uh, if you're a part of Graceway, let me encourage you to get on the web, uh, get on our website, and uh, give a listen to what I shared last week, uh, because it is an explanation of why we are like we are. I've been here for so long, and so my story, in, in a very real sense, is part of the Graceway story in, in a huge way, and explains uh, some of the emphasis that we have upon making disciples, that, that passion that we have for that. Uh, I, I think it would help you to connect the dots, and so I just encourage you to do that. Uh, and, and again, thanks to uh, Pastor Jim Lee for helping Cheryl and I. He's been uh, working uh, with us, counseling us the last several months uh, since we began to go through this period of self-discovery and uh, to think about sharing that story with you twice uh, in the same day. Six months ago, I would have been running in the other direction like Jonah. I would be like, no, man, I'm out of here. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to talk about that. But uh, so uh, that's part of the healing process, and I'm, I'm very grateful for it. Uh, making disciples of Jesus Christ is our mission. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. We've expressed that mission in many different ways through the years. Uh, but lately, we, we've been saying just simply that as a church, our mission is to fulfill the Great Commission by living the Great Commandment. And I'm going to have more to say about that in, in just a moment. But today, people talk about wanting to be organic and raw and authentic and transparent and all that type of stuff. And, and the reason that I ask you to check out my story is because when we were discovering some of these principles in the middle of a war, uh, talk about being organic, uh, we didn't have anything. We didn't have anybody's book to read, anybody's seminar to go to. Uh, we didn't have anybody's program to deploy. Uh, there was no internet. There was many times we would be cut off for months at a time. And so everything that we learned about making disciples was just us, God, and the Bible. Uh, that, that was it. And so it's about as organic as, as you can imagine. And we've continued over the years to refine that and tweak that. And that's what these next several weeks are all about, how we continue from where we are to where God would have us to be in 2016 and beyond. So would you come with me to Matthew chapter 28? I want to use this as our, uh, our text this morning, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 20. The Great Commission, as many of you know, is all over the Bible. But when we say that phrase, Great Commission, most people's mind goes to Matthew chapter 28. So let's start there this morning. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Making disciples of Jesus Christ is the very core, the very essence of what Graceway is all about. Here's, here's what it says. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven, and in earth. Go therefore, in other words, on the basis of that power, and teach all nations. Stop for just a second. That word teach does not mean to teach in a didactic way, as it does when you go down a little bit further, teaching them to observe all things. That's a totally different word in the Greek language. And the word that is used here is a word that literally means making disciples. That's the literal meaning of this word. It's correct to translate it as, as teaching, but as it, we, we must understand that the word teaching there means more than just sharing information. It means more than sitting down with somebody and saying, okay, here's our lesson for today. It involves 
teaching about everything, every aspect of life. We might use the word today holistic because it has to do with everything, making disciples of all nations. And again, if you've been around here for a while, you have probably heard me say from time to time the Greek phrase that is translated as pata, ta, ethne, which means literally every ethnicity, every ethnic group. That's our job. That's our mission. And so Jesus said, go therefore teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Our mission then is to fulfill this great commission by living the great commandment that I will share with you a little bit later. Now, I, I say this because last summer our leadership team had a leadership retreat. We brought in a consultant from a group called the Unstuck Group, and his job was to say, okay, guys, let's sit down let's talk about where we've come from, where we are, uh, what's going on in the world today, and, and where we need to go from here. And you might remember we shared with you the seven distinct initiatives that we came up with, seven different areas that we identified as being able to say, these things are really important and we want to do a much better job. And in August, we even had a commissioning service here. You remember that? Uh, probably 50 or 60 of you volunteered to go on this journey with us and we're and, and forever thankful to you for that. And different teams began to meet and began to share ways that we could do a better job in these seven areas, including, for example, organizational structure. Uh, as a result of that, we came away with a totally different organizational structure that we feel is much leaner and meaner and uh, we, we wanted to do a better job of communicating and I hope that you've seen some evidence of that over the last several months and uh, we, we wanted to do a better job of making an environment that is family friendly. We, we've had some wonderful fruit in, in that area and just so many things. We wanted to do a better job of connecting people with community. A few years ago when we started small groups in a huge way uh, we were so emphatic on that. We thought we were flexible but we learned that we weren't as flexible as we thought we were. Uh, we tightened the screws down too tightly, and, and we began to unscrew them a little bit to say, wait a minute, we're learning that not everybody is alike. Uh, one size does not necessarily fit all. And so as a result of that, you've been hearing over the last several months some of the medium-sized groups that were starting at different times, not just in homes, but some here on Wednesday nights or Sunday nights or even Sunday mornings. And, and all of that is a part to do whatever we can to help people connect in community to the body of Christ, because we believe that that is so important. But the centerpiece of everything that we did revolved around what I want to share with you this morning. It, it revolved around how can we as a church community do a better job of making disciples of Jesus Christ that in turn make disciples of Jesus Christ, that in turn make disciples of Jesus Christ. How can we do a better job of what we've just read here in Matthew chapter 7. So this morning, I want to set a foundation for the next several weeks in this I Am Graceway series. Every week you're going to be hearing some different parts of someone's story, but basically what we're going to be doing, we're going to be talking about how do we, from this point forward, do an even better job, thankful for our heritage, thankful for all the good things that God has done over the years, how can we do an even better job moving forward. Today I want to talk about what that is. And then the next several weeks we want to talk about, okay, how do we do that? And what does that look like at Graceway? So we want to break down what I'm going to say this morning in the next several weeks and uh, how do we actually live this out. Our mission, as we've seen pretty clear, is to make disciples of Jesus Christ of all of the different ethnicities of the world. So what does Matthew 28 that we just read, what does that really teach? What does that really imply? What is the essence of being a disciple of Jesus Christ? What does that word even mean? A disciple in, in historical context and in biblical context as well, the word simply means someone who has made a conscious intentional decision to submit to a master, to a teacher, in order to learn from that individual how to do something, how to live that out. In, in biblical times and many places in the world today, if, if a young child was seven or eight years of age and mom and dad wanted that child to have a future, they might apprentice that child to a shoemaker. 
or to a blacksmith or to a candlestick maker. What, what do I know? I mean, you, you, would, you would send that child to be an apprentice, apprentice to that master. And, and for the next several years, that child would learn from that person how to do what that other person does until they were ready to strike out on their own and be that. And we still see that system many places around the world today and even in modern America. If you're a world-class musician, you're a student of somebody. And, and that's very important even on your resume. And sometimes if you go to a classical concert, if you read the bio of, of whoever the soloist is that night, they will likely have, well, they've been a student of this person or that person. And it means that they've spent a considerable period of time with that individual to learn how to do better according to the gifts and skills that they have. Now, the reason that I'm telling you that is because I want you to understand something. Being a disciple is more than just hanging out with somebody. And, and here in our culture today, a, a lot of people have kind of fallen into the attitude, well, I want, I want to disciple somebody, so we're just going to hang out and do life. Well, there's nothing wrong with hanging out and doing life. But the point is, being a disciple implies an intentional commitment to have a relationship with other people in order to learn to live, to do, to be in a certain way. So it's a conscious decision. And, and by the way, in the first century, that was the only thing that people understood by the word disciple. And there was no religious or spiritual significance to that word at all. It was just a way of life. If you wanted to learn to be something, you became someone's disciple. That's just the way that life was. In the biblical context, a disciple of Jesus Christ, even today, is someone who has made a conscious decision to say, all right, I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, I'm going to follow Him, and I'm going to learn of Him. So from the passage we just read, what does that mean? Well, number one, it necessarily involves following Christ in baptism. That's what he said. That is a, a public testimony of having placed faith in Jesus Christ. And also, it is a public commitment to the greater community of believers. Now think about that for a second. If, if you're not willing to follow Christ in baptism, you can be a believer. You can't be a disciple. That's what it means. If you're not willing to learn from the Word of God, then you might be a nice person, you might believe in God, but you're not a disciple because it involves learning to obey, to observe the things that Jesus taught. And it involves reproducing ourselves, disciples making other disciples of all the peoples and ethnicities in the world. So here's the conclusion. Not all believers are disciples. There's a lot of believers. There's not as many disciples. Our mission is to make disciples. That's what we are to do. The thief who died beside Jesus on the cross never had a chance to be a disciple. I mean, he was, he was leaving this world at the same time that Jesus was. And Jesus said to him, because he put his faith in him, today you'll be with me in paradise. But he never had a chance to be a disciple. So being a disciple... It's not a means to gain eternal life. It's not a means of, of being saved or being forgiven of sin. That comes from placing your faith in Jesus Christ, believing that what He did on the cross, He did for you and for me. Being a disciple is something beyond that. That's where it begins. And it's very important, but it's beyond that. Multitudes came to see and to hear Jesus. Not all of them were disciples. Now, the word church, when we say, I'm going to church, you've probably heard me say before that the word church just literally means assembly. And there was no spiritual significance to that in biblical times either. In fact, in Acts chapter 19, the Apostle Paul had been preaching in the city of Ephesus and stirred up a mess because so many people were coming to Christ and the city of Ephesus was given to worshiping the goddess Diana. And because of that, there was a, a trade union there of people who made silver images of the goddess Diana. That was how they made their living. And so many people were coming to faith in Jesus Christ that their sales were plummeting. 
And, and Paul sparked a riot. You remember that? They, they drug Paul into the big amphitheater in, uh, in, in Ephesus, 25,000 seats in this amphitheater. They were, they were going to kill him. And uh, it, it actually says in the book of Acts, now we don't translate it this way because people would misunderstand, but the same Greek word, ekklesia, that gives us church, is used to speak of this assembly of people wanting to kill Paul. Who is wanting to kill Paul? The church. Not in the sense that we use the word today, but my point is the word in itself has no spiritual significance. It just means an assembly of people. And so when you apply it to our context today, what are we doing here today? A church is not a building, and we're grateful for our building, especially in January when it's cold outside. Thank you, God. Uh, but that's not a church. A church is not an organization. It's not a denomination. It's an assembly of people. And so if you are assembled here today with us to learn of Jesus and to worship God, uh, thank you for that. You're part of the church. Sometimes people say, how can I be a part of Graceway? Well, if you're here, you are. <laughs> but we want you to go beyond that. Number one, if you're visiting with us today, our first priority is to make sure that you understand what Jesus Christ did, who He is, that He's God in human form who came to die uh, on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, that He rose again from the dead on the third day, that we might have life and that we might have forgiveness of sin. We want you to understand that. We want you to be a believer in Jesus Christ. But beyond that, and this is, this is the essence of what I'm trying to communicate today, we're not so much looking for church members. We're looking for, <coughs> excuse me, disciples of Jesus Christ. We want you to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And you're welcome to hang out with us. You're welcome to do life with us. We're excited about that. But being a disciple of Jesus Christ is an intentional, conscious decision. I will follow him. I will do what he told me to do. So disciples are constantly growing in their knowledge of the Bible. They're constantly growing and reproducing themselves in a missional way as they give, as they serve, as they reproduce themselves and others. So this would probably be a good minute, a uh, good moment for me to ask you a question. Are you, you, a disciple of Jesus Christ? You may be a believer, I hope that you are, and if you're not, by the way, we'd love to talk to you after the service today. We'd love to explain what it means about who Jesus is and what He did, how He rose again from the dead. We'd love to talk to you about that. But my question right now is this, whether you're a believer, whether you're thinking about becoming a believer, my, my question is, are you biblically a disciple of Jesus Christ? I can't answer the question for you because it's a decision that only you can make. Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? And our, our, our objective here at Graceway has never been to have the hippest church or the biggest church. We want to be a church that makes disciples who make disciples. And we've seen some amazing stuff happen over the years. You know, it, it was interesting to me. I, I, one of the many emails I got this last week was from a gentleman in the Philippines who watched my story. Now, now let me explain. Here, here's how this works. There was a gentleman who came to Graceway many years ago, not long after I came as lead pastor. And here he came to faith and he became, listen to me, a disciple of Jesus Christ. He studied here. He learned here. And from here, God gave him a job in Saudi Arabia, of all places. And so in Saudi Arabia, he, a very dangerous place to be a Christian, by the way, openly. But God began to connect him with all different types of people. And you know what he did? He continued making disciples. And as a result of him spending six or seven years in Saudi Arabia, there are now entire churches of Filipinos in Canada that were started by disciples that he made in Saudi Arabia. And the guy that wrote me this email last week is an Indian. He's from India, that type of Indian who met our guy in Saudi Arabia, was discipled, and instead of going back to India, he went to the Philippines as a missionary and is now making disciples who make disciples because a disciple that was made a disciple here at Graceway went to Saudi Arabia to make disciples. You, you get the picture? And, and that's the way that this works. 
And so can I tell you as pastor, and, and hopefully after you heard my story last week, you'll understand why I don't really care whether we're ever the biggest or the hippest church in Kansas City or, or even East Kansas City or even on, on the, of the hippest, coolest churches on the borderline that straddles Kansas City and Raytown. I don't care. We want to be a church that makes disciples of Jesus Christ, that make disciples of Jesus Christ wherever in the world God leads them. Sam said in his testimony earlier as he told his I Am Graceway story, you know, we've watched a lot of people come and go and go for different reasons. And, you know, sometimes people get upset and they go somewhere else or whatever. And sometimes people move and, and they get a new job. They, they move to a different place. And sometimes God just does some remarkable things in people's life that bring them to a different place to continue making disciples of Jesus Christ. Are you a disciple? I can't answer that for you. Are you a disciple? And, and the Bible defines our mission of making disciples, not our methods, by the way. The mission's pretty clear. Make disciples. But the methods are open. I love that about God. We have a God-mandated mission, and, and the Bible simply says that those desiring to follow Christ as disciples should publicly witness their faith through baptism and commit to the community of believers and commit to observe or obey all the things that Jesus taught and, and that they should then go and do the same thing to impact the lives of others. I mean, that's what the Bible says. Now, how that happens from culture to culture and from time to time is going to vary greatly. It's varied here over the last 30 so years. Why? Because we're aiming at a moving target. Society changes. People change. Culture changes. God doesn't change. God's truth doesn't change. The mission doesn't change. It's just what everything else does. Now, don't confuse making disciples with the methods of making disciples. Making disciples has always been the focus of our, our ministry. Those of you, by the way, who have been around a long time, oh, we're going to change everything. No, we're not changing really anything. We're, we're going about tweaking and evolving and improving what we've always done, which is making disciples who make disciples. How do we do that in the most relevant and the most effective way possible now? What we've been doing for many years is still valid. When I first came here, of course, you heard my story last week. We, we first started thinking about making disciples during the middle of a war when the outreach of our church grew from maybe 400 to several thousand people each weekend. And all the people that we were reaching were brand new believers. They had no background in Scripture. They had no understanding of, of the Bible or, or biblical Christianity. Coming to Christ in the middle of a war, and, and we don't have anything to work with. We don't have any tools, we don't have any materials, we, we, we don't have any way to get them, we're just, we're just there. And so in the Word of God, we began to say, God, how can we do this? Well, in, in our situation, meeting in people's living rooms and small groups wasn't really an option that was available. And so we, we focused on people reproducing themselves one-on-one, -on -one, which is great. And, and, and unfortunately, sometimes as we began to share this with other people, they got the idea, oh, that's the only way to do it. No, it's a way to do it. But it's not the way. It's not even the way that Jesus did it. Jesus worked with people in small groups. Now, it's not wrong to work with somebody one-on-one -on -one or couple-to-couple -couple or whatever, whatever it may be, but we tend to confuse the methods sometimes with the mission. And the mission is to make disciples. And so when I talk about making disciples, I want you to understand something. When we talk about making disciples at Graceway, we, we in no way mean to imply that the way that we do it is the only way to do it. No, it's the way that we do it. And, and we're, we're trying to get better at it all the time. But it's not the only way to do it. It's our way to do it. And it's, it's a way that we change from time to time. So how do we make disciples? If making disciples is what we do, how do we do that? How do we fulfill the Great Commission? And I said earlier, we do that by living the great commandment. You know what that is, right? Jesus was once asked by a lawyer, what was the greatest commandment? What was the one great commandment of all the Scripture? And you probably remember the answer that Jesus gave. He said it's to love God passionately with everything that is within you, all of your heart, mind, and strength, to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said everything in the Scripture hinges on that. 
He said you can summarize the entire Scripture by that. Love God and love others. In fact, Jesus asked another lawyer the same question on a different occasion who understood the same thing, gave him the same answer. The Apostle Paul knew the Scripture as well as anybody. He was one of the outstanding Pharisees of his day, one of the outstanding Jewish scholars. And when he came to faith in Jesus Christ, he would write the church in Rome years later. And he would say in Romans chapter 13, he would say, here's how you summarize all of the law. Love your neighbor as yourself. Later, Paul would write to a disciple of his, a young man by the name of Timothy. And, and in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul said, Now the end of the commandment, the end of the law, what all the Scripture is about is this. It's about love out of a pure heart, a good conscience, and genuine faith. James would say in James chapter 2 and verse 8, the same summary statement. He said, here's the law. Here's what it's all about. It's this. You love others. The Apostle John in 1 John chapter 4, verses 19 to 21 would say exactly the same thing. He said, here's, the, here, here's what it's all about. So when we say, let's live the Great Commission by living the Great Commandment, that's what we're talking about. How do we make disciples that make disciples? You love God with everything that's in you. And you love others. You be the channel of God's love for others. And when we do that, what we've come to is we, we've analyzed this. We, we said, okay, historically, where are we coming from? And, and what, is society, what is the state of society around us? And, and what are we learning from all of this? And where do we go moving forward? We came up with a diagram that I'm going to put up on the board here for you. This is what, what is called a Venn chart, if you're somebody into diagrams. But you'll see three circles that overlap. One representing a biblical foundation. <coughs> another representing a commitment to personal growth. And another a commitment to missional living. And I want you guys to leave that up there for just a little bit. This is, by the way, this is not a definition of discipleship. It's not a way to describe discipleship. It's simply saying that at Graceway, if we were to break down everything that we do, and say, what is the essence of being a disciple? This is what we would say. For years, we've talked about the importance of teaching people the Bible, right? We've talked about the importance of, of making disciples, and we've talked about the importance of God's global mission. That's all right there. That's exactly what that is. And I, I want you to understand, uh, again, you, you might read somebody's book or go to some other church, and, and they say, well, we, we think that, uh, you know, we, we're going to describe being a disciple this way. That's fine. And And... They're probably right. And, and so are we. <laughs> Being a disciple, could, what, what, a, what a powerful concept. Nobody's going to describe all of that. What we're saying is that at Graceway, this is the way that we're talking about being a disciple. Three key components of a disciple's life that are consistent with everything that we've always taught, everything that we've always done. Can I tell you where we came from? When I came here a little over 30 years ago, out of a war, trying to learn what it meant to be disciples, and, I, and man, I had so much, I still have so much to learn. I, I don't have all the answers, but I had less of them then. Can I tell you that 30 and 40 years ago in this country, hardly anyone was talking about making disciples? After the Second World War, we went into a time of great evangelistic emphasis. Praise God for that. A lot of people were getting saved. People were going out into the streets and sharing the four spiritual laws and the Romans road. You remember all that stuff? And, and the way of the master and everybody's going around winning people to Jesus, which, which is great. Uh, that, that's where it all starts. But 30 or 40 years ago, if, if, of course, Amazon didn't exist, the Internet didn't exist, but if it would have, and you would have gotten on Amazon 40 years ago and done a search of books on disciple making, it had been a pretty short list. Nobody was talking about it. Nobody was writing anything about it. And so when Cheryl and I came here 30 years ago and started talking about making disciples, it was radical. It shouldn't have been. It's biblical. But it was not what was happening. And because of that, we started getting the attention of churches in a lot of different places who said, show us how to do that. Sure, great, no problem. Uh, and and as, as we went around doing that, 
We, we so emphasized teaching people the Bible because that, that just wasn't being talked about. And so we, we came up with some material. Okay, look, if you want to lay a biblical foundation in somebody's life, it needs to include this. And, and here's what happened. Along the way, because we emphasized that so much, but we hadn't grown to understand the need for community. We hadn't grown to understand the need for personal growth and personal application. Along the way, can I just be honest with you? We accidentally made some Pharisees. Didn't mean to. And that doesn't mean they're bad people. You've heard me say before, the Pharisees in Jesus' day weren't bad people. They believed the Bible. They, they had great personal and family values, but they missed God because they couldn't separate methods and tradition from truth. And can I just say, being humans, we've struggled with the same stuff. And so over these last several months, as we, if we've been analyzing, okay, what have we done good? What have we done bad? What are the missing elements? That's why we said, let's put this down in a way that we can communicate. Our reality, as I said a moment ago, is that society is constantly changing. The way that people process information in a digital age, the shrinking of the world. You can hop on a plane and be anywhere in the world in a matter of hours. Wow. And, and the fact that people just don't go to church in America anymore like they did when I was growing up, uh, it's a different place. So where are we now? People today, I think anywhere, honestly, crave being connected in genuine community. People today respond better to teaching that is interactive and creative and not just sitting down across the table from somebody who's going to tell them what to believe. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying that that's the way that people are responding today. They want that teaching to be creative. They want it to be interactive. And people tend to learn more today through self-discovery than somebody just didactically saying, you're going to believe this because that's what we believe. Uh, I, want to, I want to see that. I want to, I want to touch that. I want to feel that. I want to understand that. So because of that, we're continually evolving. Can I challenge you? I want to challenge every one of you here this morning to do something in 2016. I want to challenge every one of you to move beyond merely being a believer in Jesus Christ. And by the way, if you're not yet a believer in Jesus Christ, I'm glad you're here. Please keep considering that and would love to help push you over that edge to putting your faith in Jesus Christ. But if you're a believer, can I challenge you this year to become a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And what, what does that look like? Well, you remember the diagram up here just a moment ago? You see where those three circles intersect? We, we call that the sweet spot. That's where we want to live. The reason that there are three circles is because this is nonlinear. It's not like circle one, circle two, circle three. No, 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 no. And, and there are multiple entry points. However you come into it, in, into Graceway, into our community, however, some people come in through a mission trip. Some people come in through a class that we offer. Some people come in through attending a church service and putting their faith in Jesus. However you come into our community, our goal is for you to be a disciple living in the sweet spot where all three circles interact, where all of these three components are active in your life at the same time. You have a biblical foundation of truth in your life. And you're committed to not being satisfied with that, but to continuing to grow personally. If you don't grow, you die. And at the same time, we want you to be committed to missional living, loving others, making a difference in the lives of others. So biblical foundation, deepening our faith and understanding of God. Our, ladies and gentlemen, our faith is not something we invented. A lot of times churches put a statement of faith. Graceway did not invent our faith. Our faith has been passed down from generation to generation and culture to culture for the past 2,000 years. 
We may disagree about certain aspects of of some of the more complicated things in the Bible. That's fine. But there is a commonality of belief, who Jesus Christ is, what He did in His death, burial, and resurrection, the authority of Scripture. There are elements of truth that we didn't invent those things. They've been passed down through through the centuries. Having that biblical foundation means you've made a commitment to follow Jesus and you've publicly given witness to that through baptism. Publicly declaring, I will follow Him. And at the same time, connecting to and being connected with the bigger community of believers. But you know what? As I said earlier, just having a foundation of faith is not enough. It's good. We, it's necessary. But if all you do is have a bunch of information about the Bible, you could end up a Pharisee too. Because there's more to it. It also is that commitment to continued personal growth, developing a holistic and healthy lifestyle of maturing. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ is not a once and done thing. In fact, Peter in Second Peter chapter 1, in verse 5, Peter said, add to your faith, and then he listed a number of qualities and attitudes that we need to add to our faith. And that's not meant to be an exclusive list, by the way. He's just simply saying the same thing that I'm saying. If you're going to be a disciple, it involves a commitment to be continually growing. You add to your faith. And then when he concluded that letter in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, he said, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the reason we talk about discipleship being holistic is because God's grace needs to affect everything in your life, every area of your life, physically, mentally, socially, relationally, in terms of your work, vocationally, everything. In in the Gospel of Luke that we've been studying, we'll be back in Luke next month, by the way, but in the Gospel of Luke, you remember in the early chapters we saw examples of both John the Baptist and Jesus and how Luke said they grew, and they grew in these areas holistically. They grew physically, they grew relationally, they grew emotionally, they grew spiritually in terms of knowledge of God. And so should we. We should have a commitment to continue to grow. And then, missional living, discovering our role in God's plan to disciple others. Serving and living with purpose to make a difference in somebody else's life. Well, I just want to be connected. I just, I just want something more than attending church. I, I just want to know that my life is making a difference. Hello, welcome to making disciples. That's where that happens. But you have to first be a disciple to reproduce yourself in someone else. I had a couple come to me a few weeks ago and uh, they were so excited. They said, okay, we've got a goal. Over the next several months, we're going to bring 50 people to Graceway. I'm like, God bless you. Can I tell you that every week they're in Guest Central, they've got somebody else with them. In fact, he he brought somebody today and said, 41 more to go. (laughs) Like, wow, that is so cool. Again, the issue is not attending church, but the point that this couple is trying to make is they have an intentional commitment to live in a missional way, to make a difference in the lives of others. Practically, what we're doing is to be more effective in making disciples. Number one, putting the focus on the main thing, making disciples. That's nothing new. We've been doing this for all these years. We want to live life in that sweet spot where all of these things are active in our life at the same time. And as a leadership team, we spent the last several months going over everything that we do as a church to say, hey, if it's not making a difference in one of these three areas, why are we doing it? And so some of, the, some of the things that we're doing are like, you know, that's really a nice thing to do. It's a lot of fun, but maybe that's not really contributing to what we need to be doing, making disciples. Secondly, we've made the pathway as clear and as simple as possible. Nonlinear, multiple entry points already have talked about that. Rather than talk about everyone having to go through the direction study, uh, we're, we're building it in to the disciple process. And by the way, we're, we're going if, if you've not been through the direction study and you'd like to, we're going to have a kind of a condensed version of that starting this month. And you can find information on the website or maybe somebody will talk about it a little bit later. 
Thirdly, we want to meet people where they are. People today have a real hard time making long commitments. Life's complicated, right? And, and so when you say to somebody, hey, you want to be a disciple? Will you commit uh, uh, taking this course over the next year? Like, what? <laughs> but you know what we're finding? We've been doing this in a beta testing form for the last several months, and we've had amazing success with both young people and old people alike. We're very excited about it. We're, we're saying, you want to be a disciple? Give us six weeks of your life, and we're going to show you what it's all about. Can you do that? Yeah. Most people can make a decision. Make a commitment for six weeks. Here's what's happened in almost every case. At the end of six weeks, we're hearing, Oh, oh, I can't stop. I can't stop. Would you like to re-up for another six, six weeks? Okay, okay. And then you guessed it. What happens at the end of that six weeks? Same deal. And by the time that process has matured a little bit more, you have people that are living as disciples, growing in a biblical foundation, growing personally in ways that some of them have never seen before, people who've been believers for 30 and 40 years, and learning to live in a missional way, even after all this time. It has been exciting. You're going to hear about that over these next several weeks. But if you want a head start, you can do that. Here's my question to you today, and I want, I want you to take this home. Okay. First of the year, go back to work tomorrow, right? Go back to school, all that type of stuff. Some of you went back to work last week. And uh, poor people, I'm so sorry about that. But uh, here, here's what I want you to think about. Am I really a disciple of Jesus Christ? If you are, there's certain metrics. You've been baptized. You're committed to establishing a foundation of biblical truth in your life, and you've manifest that in whatever ways that make that possible. If, if you're committed to be a disciple, then I would ask you, so who's your disciple? Because disciples make disciples. Disciples don't sit. Disciples make disciples. Are you a disciple? And what steps or step will you take in 2016 to truly be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Guys, we have such an amazing opportunity. We're already a majority, or minority majority church. Uh, we, we've got a network of people and churches around the world that look to us for leadership and mentorship. And if we can continue to learn how to do a more effective way in a modern world, of making disciples of Jesus Christ. The one example that I shared with you about an Indian who met one of our people in Saudi Arabia who's now a missionary in the Philippines who hears my story. I, I, <laughs> there are so many stories like that. And we want there to be more and more and more because disciples make disciples. Come on this journey with us be a disciple. Father, we would ask that your Spirit give us mental and emotional clarity right now to be able to answer these questions intelligently and accurately. Am I a disciple of Jesus Christ? Father, thank you for the opportunities that you've given us over the years to encourage people in that process. And would you help us, Lord, to be even more effective in the future than we've been in the past. We love you, and we pray that our lives might truly reflect what it means to live in that sweet spot of having a foundation of truth, that biblical foundation of being committed to growing and being committed to living in a missional way. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and ask the ushers to come forward and I want to touch base with you guys real quick. Um, you know, if, if after the message today you, you are being led by God, it is, it is time for you to make a decision about baptism. Uh, I encourage you to, after you leave here today, walk out, make a right. Our connections room is right there on the right side. They will be able to walk you through what that's like, to schedule that, to set that up. If you have questions about how to get involved here at Graceway or how to be a part of what we're doing, uh, go to the connection counter. 
If you need to volunteer, it's right out front when you first walk out. There's some great opportunities to be able to serve with us. We also have the guest lounge where you can meet Jeff, meet a few of us that were on stage today. Uh, if you'd just like to say hello or tell us about what brought you here, we'd love to hear that. And the 17th and the 24th this month will be our group fair. And that is going to be a great time for you to be able to find a place to build some community in. You know, when we talk about that, those three circles, uh, groups encompasses all of that. Uh, You know, our study groups will tackle that biblical foundation. And all three of those, to some degree, will handle missional living. And the personal growth can come out of study groups, can come out of the home groups, can come out of medium-sized groups. So I encourage you to be a part of that. So 17th and the 24th, there'll be tables in the lobby. You can go out there. You can find out what different uh, what different groups there are that, are that are coming together in January. I encourage you guys to find your place there to be a part of that, to be able to have people around you that can speak into your life, that know what's going on with you, and to be able to develop you as you develop them is crucial in our walk. Now, we're going to take the offering here, and if you, if you held on to that Connect card and you're new or you have questions, this is the time that you can just drop that right in there. Okay, we'd love to hear about your visit today. If you want to partner with us, you want to be a part of what God is doing here through Graceway, obviously you can definitely use the buckets. You can also text Graceway to 77977, and they can get you the, you get the app, so you can just set that right up and run that right through, all right? Because God desires for us to experience his generosity, and we do that by modeling his generosity. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, I love you, and Lord, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for this time that we could come together as a body. And Lord, we are excited as we start this new year. We're excited about what you want to do here. And Lord, as, as the staff has worked on this for months now, it is just bubbling up inside us that we, we're so excited to move forward. And Lord, I pray that you would be in this. I pray that you would direct and guide as you already have that your will would be accomplished and that you would create something amazing here. Lord, we pray that you would take this offering, that you would use it to just glorify your name, or that you would use it that those that don't know you would come to find out who you are. And Lord, we pray that they would never be the same. Lord, we pray that we would never be the same. I pray that in December of this year, as we look back, that we will realize that individually and as a church, we are nothing like we were when we started we are more like your son and we are growing every day. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Have a good week.